And so we are going to have now the presentation uh, with uh, Foy Shiver from APWG. And um, he's going to talk to us about collaborative efforts to fight malicious website. Ford. Get it. Buenos <laughs> dias. Um, I was going to start out with a little Spanish, but I'm not confident enough. I have been practicing. So next time I come back. Delacnic, I'll be ready. So, no, mi español es muy malo. That's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> um, yeah, so, as you said, um, Foy Shire at APWG, um, the, we started out as the anti-phishing working group. Uh, I know I have some very familiar faces, but I'll cover a little background just for those that don't know us. Um, APWG was founded as the anti-phishing working group in 2003. Um, Actually, it was begun by a group called Tumbleweed. It was a security company out of Boston, uh, Cambridge area. As a marketing tool, they were going to try to push their products by creating this working group. Um, it didn't go the way they planned. Uh, Dave Jevons, our chairman, was one of the heads of Tumbleweed. Picked it up, called Peter Cassidy. Peter called me and we said, yeah, this sounds like a good thing. We'll get together. We'll focus on this problem for a few months. We'll fix fishing and then we'll go on and do something else with our lives. As you can see, I'm still doing this. Um, so from there, you know, we started to evolve currently. Um, We've got a roughly 2,000 organizations that we work with globally. Um, these have a breadth of industries we cross between financial, technology companies, work with a lot of governments, um, law enforcement, you know, uh, anyone that has a reason to be concerned with cybercrime and works in the industry, we pretty much work with them. Uh, lots of research organizations as well. Uh, as we evolved, we've learned that we don't, we no longer focus strictly on phishing. We pretty much, it's electronic crime in general, uh, fraud and crime on the internet. Um, we've got our hands in there somewhere. This is kind of the areas we've evolved into that we have focused most of our time. Um, initially, since the beginning, we've been tracking trends and activities in the industry uh, and then publishing those out. Um, I'll show some of the reports in just a minute. We were also very involved in electronic crime research. Uh, so with institutions globally, we work closely to help promote research in the industry specifically focused on electronic crime, so cyber crime in general. Um, from there, we do a lot of cyber policy. We have an ongoing group uh, called the Internet Policy Committee uh, that meets every couple of weeks to talk about policy issues in the industry. Uh, we then advise that back out. We've done a lot of work with uh, um, the U.S. government, DHS, the White House, the EU government, Canada, Canada, sorry. <laughs> There's nobody Canadian in here, right? So I'm okay. <laughs> Long joke about Canada. Um, and then uh, push that back out to ICANN as well. I mean, they participate in the working group, but we do create report outs that we take back to ICANN and, and talk to them a lot uh, on different issues. Education and user awareness. This is a, another big area we're into. Um, I'm going to have another talk this afternoon, or it may be next. We'll never know. Sorry, Garcia. That was a joke. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about our Stop the Connect campaign, which is our biggest push trying to raise user awareness on electronic crime and fraud. Um, but then again, that kind of goes back also to our research and working in the industry as well. And finally, data logistics. Um, this is kind of the meat, the back end that a lot of our members participate with to share information between organizations. We take a lot of this data in and push that back out. Uh, so mentioned, we've started out really looking at statistics. So gathering information, we've been doing this for, um, I actually need to update that, it's over 12 years now. Um, I should have caught that. So we've, the fishing activity and trends report, uh, at first we were doing it monthly. We realized it's kind of hard to evaluate in one month what's going on. So we've been doing it quarterly. Um, 
started uh, about six, seven years ago going quarterly. Uh, these are available on our website, so you can look and see kind of how electronic crime has morphed and evolved, um, which countries have the biggest problems and what their particular issues may be. Uh, the latest report is in editing now. Hopefully we're gonna get that out um, in the next couple of weeks for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I thought it would be good timing, actually. Um, then back in 2007, we started the Global Phishing Survey. So this mostly looks at DNS. So looking at trends in domain name and use, um, this one we do twice a year. Um, we'll probably release it around the 1st of November, which will cover the first half of this year. Um, and then we'll do another report out at our meeting in uh, next year in Toronto. And then in 2003, we started the mobile threats, kind of looking at mobile specifically and what type of issues, what affects this particular industry is, as opposed to the global industry. Um, the second report of this, we did a lot of work with this at our Barcelona meeting. We do a lot of work at our meetings, not just presentations. We actually try to get something done once in a while. And the second issue of this will be out hopefully by the end of the year. It would have been out already, but our main editor had some family issues and was out for a couple of months. So sorry it's not out already, but things aren't always what they should be. So one of the big questions that, that we like to focus on and what I wanted to talk about specifically today instead of going into all those other details is, you know, how do we share information? How logistically, globally can we focus on cybercrime and try to make it better for all of us? So what we call data logistics. Um, the design and optimization process to manage the movement and presentation of data to enable cybercrime responders and forensic analysis to take action, to get the data and then do something with it. Um, so this kind of theme falls behind a lot of what APWG works on. Um, you know, different initiatives that we've uh, done throughout the years. Here's some examples. Um, you know, the phishing repository, these I'm going to talk about a little at length at the top. Our e crime exchange, the new malicious domain suspension system, and the education landing pages. Hopefully I got those slides in there. Um, these, the Stop, Think, Connect, I'll talk about this afternoon. And these other two, the classification and the botnet stuff, I'm not going to go into those too much today. Um, they're both kind of stalled. We, they both need a new um, leader, basically, to, to push those working groups a little further. Because uh, uh, one thing about our organization is it's extremely small. Um, Core employees full time, there are four of us. Uh, and that's it. Um, then we've got some part timers that help us out, obviously, with web stuff and development and other things. But most of the work is done by our members. You know, we're real fortunate to have a good circle that we collaborate with and we get a lot done. Um, but we do depend on our members to do that. Uh, and, and fortunately, we've got some really good folks working with us. So to start out looking at the, the e-crime exchange, which is just kind of what we, we've created a back end for our data and a way for our users to interact with each other, and this is what we called it, the e-crime exchange. Um, the goal here is to allow us to gang up on the bad guys, get us together so we're sharing data, sharing information, and we can focus on particular problems as we go forward. Uh, the system itself has a little bit of a um, social network built into the background. I don't like to call it that because social networks are bad. They're evil, apparently. But if we get the right people working together, they're not bad, and we can share information and keep it all inside and, and hopefully solve some of these problems. So initially back in 04, uh, Dave and, and Alex and a few of our developers created the initial block list. And this is where we built a, a community with our members and started collecting malicious URLs. So at that point it was strictly phishing and to this date it's still primarily phishing, but we malicious URLs in general. If it's a bad URL and it's uploading data or you know, attacking users, we want to get it into the feed. Um, the eight and a half million number, I just about quit updating that because you can't keep up with it anymore. Um, it grows 
constantly daily. We've been integrating a lot of new data feeds. Um, we actually are directly connected into the Facebook and LinkedIn now. We're working with Microsoft, getting a pipe directly in. Uh, traditionally, the system was a um, SFTP a system and you had to pull it. Uh, we do have an API that was part of the development for the UBL. But you know the information comes up. It's used by a lot of different our browser vendors, AV vendors. You know the list goes on and on. Um, and uh, the uh, you know a lot of the search, we pull the data so anyone from the public can actually post a phishing, a suspected phishing URL or a phishing email to us. We will process that on a back end. Then we push that back out. Now, if it comes from a public entity, then we just look at it and say, yeah, it looks like one. We're going to give it a, a confidence of 50. So each URL is tagged with a confidence level. Um, if it's somebody, so some of our partners, they have automated routines that run in the background. They find these URLs, they push those in. If it's automated from a vetted company, we give it a 90% confidence. Because we're pretty sure it's going to be legit, but unless we know it came from a partner and it's been human validated, it doesn't get 100%. But depending on, if you look at our members list, you can get an idea of who our members are. A lot of this data is already vetted when it gets to us. Uh, but it comes from certs, it comes from our big partners that we work with, and uh, it's available to um, all of our members at the sponsoring level and above, um, or law enforcement, government, and research institutions get everything complimentary. Part of what we've done by creating the ECX, I'm going to talk about it just a little bit more, is we created a new level. One of the complaints we were getting um, was that some small organizations, especially credit unions or smaller banks, um, some of the small security companies, felt that our membership level was too high for them to participate. Um, so we came up with this one for the small groups. It's only $1,000 a year and they get first access, so if they're a small bank and they see an attack and they've got a malicious URL they know is attacking them, they can assign one person that we vet and they can then put that data into the system and it goes in at 100%, so they get the full confidence. Um, and that we, we put in and that goes into some of the other systems we're working with as well so that we can allow a broader audience to participate. But you know, it's still everyone has to understand that at the end of the day, we still have to pay the bills to keep the lights on as well, so we do need something here. We can't just give it all away. So the other system we've built, and this one we, we rolled out last year with our steering committee members and a couple of our um, registry and registrar uh, members, and we've been testing it and it's going well. Um, now we're starting to push to get more participation. So this is a primary system just to focus on malicious domains and get them removed from the DNS. So what we've done is, is on the back end, we've built a system where you don't necessarily have to have a court order. We just have some legal instruments to allow this. We've worked with a lot of different organizations. And what we've done is we vet users and we connect them to the registry and registrar authorities. Um, and this way, we've created a standard checklist that people have to meet up to. So in trying to circumvent the way we've been doing things from years of if I see a, I find a malicious domain and it's registered at this particular registry, um, hopefully I know somebody that works there and I pull out my Rolodex and I give them a call. Unfortunately, that doesn't work for a lot of organizations because a lot of them can't send people to every first meeting and to every LACNIC and AP CERT meeting so that they know everybody when they have a problem and need to pick up the phone. Um, hopefully this can help circumvent a lot of those problems. So the, um, basically the system creates two different entities. You have our accredited interveners and the registry authority. So the registry authorities, your registries and your registrars, the people that are responsible for the different domains and their registration on the DNS. 
So they can participate at their level and come into the system and we register their users or their um, security teams. And then on the other side, we've created what we're calling the accredited intervener. So these are us, the people that are working out here daily, finding these URLs or these malicious domains and needing to get them removed, needing to get them taken down. Uh, and that was one of the things our lawyers have told us. We don't call them takedowns. They're being removed from the DNS. Uh, I don't know why, but ask the lawyers. Um, so where APWG comes into this is, is one, hosting the system, and we've built it and it's here and it's ready, but the second step is vetting these interveners. So we've got a, a list that, once again, we worked with legal to come up with. How do we define a company as legitimate so that when they come into the system, they can take these domains down. So it's things like, do they have business insurance? If they've been in business for several years, not two weeks, um, you know, are they participating in different organizations? And we know that their people are trained and up to the proper speed so that when they come in and there's a, an attestation, um, it's called, it's a form that when they find a domain, they put the domain in and then they have to check off seven different areas and digitally sign this to say, I have done these things and I have defined that there's, this is malicious content, this is, there's no legitimate content on this domain. If there's legitimate content, then they should be putting malicious URLs in the other system. If there's no legitimate content, then we want to get the thing pulled off the DNS. Uh-oh. No, no, I decline. <laughs> so, okay, this is just a pretty picture that basically goes through what I just said. What we've tried to do is create a formal auditable, see I can't even speak English, communications channel to ping these two groups together. So once again, everybody that's doing this doesn't have to know all the people that work over there. When the registry or registrar receives a report, they don't have to go, where did it come from? Who did this come from? Do I know this individual? Um, they can take for granted that we have already done that process of vetting the individuals and then they can act. And the agreement we've created for the registries and registrars simply states that once they receive an attestation that says this is a malicious domain and it needs to be removed, that within two hours they will either remove it or they will respond as to why they are not going to remove it. And there is understandable, there's a lot of domains out there that might be under investigation by law enforcement or some other type of facility and then we would understand, fine, that's a legitimate reason, but you need to tell us why you're not gonna take it down if you're gonna participate. So benefits for interveners, you know, they get credibility, they don't have to know everybody. For the registry and registrars, they know that these are coming in, they can judge that it's a criminal domain without having to worry about um, all the details. So in order to be eligible, it has to be maliciously registered and criminally abusive, okay? Just says, you know, it's, it's fraudulent or stealing funds from someone. And again, we're not really changing who owns this process. The registries and registrars are still responsible. We're not changing that. We're just creating a way for all these organizations that may be under attack or may be investigating attacks can get that to the right authorities at the registries and registrars. And some other goals of the system as we go through are metrics. Once we get this rolling, um, and right now we're starting to, to recruit more of your registries and registrars. We're working pretty closely with ICANN and other groups. Um, obviously our members are participating in the system already. Um, anyone that's interested, let us know. But I'm hoping 18 months from now I can create a metrics and I probably won't publish it, but I'll make sure somebody does that says these are good registries and these are bad registries because they don't do good things. But we'll see if I get that. 
Um, I knew I was missing a slide. Forget that for now. Um, the other thing I would, the other one that was on the list of things that we don't have a slide for here is talking about there. Um, we have a program which actually, come to think of it, it'll be talked about this afternoon as well. Um, one way we've been working is trying to, uh, to educate our users. We created a system some years back called the um, Redirect Program. Um, where ISPs can get involved, and so if we find a phishing URL, uh, a lot of times they just take the URL down, okay, so it's just gone, and if somebody clicks on the link, they just get a 404, which doesn't help anybody. Okay, it's like, oh, it's not there. The redirect program actually steps in and redirects to a page that currently, I believe we have 20 languages supported. Maybe it's 21. Um, I think 21 if you count US English and the Queen's English differently, which it does have two different ones. Um, but what it does is when the user clicks the link, it puts up an education page and it tells them, you just clicked on a malicious link. And here are some things to take into consideration so that you don't do this again. And it has been extremely productive and very useful. Um, we, you know, uh, we, ho we host it, it's out there for free, anybody can use it. Um, we also have some organizations that have taken it, the, we, the source is available, and they've taken it and rebranded it and used it internally. Um, a couple of governments, the Japanese government, the Anti-Fishing Council of Japan, have their own .jp site that they host using this and they direct to as well. So that's out there, there's not a slide here. There will be one in this afternoon's presentation, I'll make sure. And the only other thing to, to talk a little bit about is, is within the organization, just like our friends at MOG and our friends in the first community, networking is very, very important. And part of that is meetings like this, where we all get together and get to know each other. Uh, our next major meeting is gonna be in Toronto in June. This is our e-crime researchers program. So this is the one where we actually run a um, peer-reviewed research program with universities, and now you don't have to be a university student. We have had industry players present their work and get it published as well. But out of the presentations, um, you know, like I say, they're totally blind, peer-reviewed. And the selected papers each year, we bring them in and we take an afternoon and they get to get up and present their work in front of your Microsofts, your Googles, Semantics, McAfee's, Citibanks, blah, 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 blah. And we do give cash awards to the top three papers. It's not big awards, but when you're a grad student, $1,000 is a lot of money. I'm sure some of you probably have been there. <laughs> Uh, so we'll be presenting those at this one, and then from there we fill out the content with you know, what's current in the industry, we try to get topical presentations, and we have lots of networking opportunities so we can all get to know each other. Um, and I think that's about it. If we have time, I'll take questions, and I'm here all week. From there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hoyt. So we are open to questions. Oh, nobody from Brazil, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know me, man, I always have to have a question. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I think it's very interesting the, the, the thing that you mentioned about um, having a, a, once the, the malicious website's taken down, putting a page, an educational page about it. It's, I think it's a great idea. It's, it's a way of, uh, of um, we talk about a lot about the end user education. So, uh, and if we just keep removing and they have no idea what's going on there. So yeah. I think it's a great uh, uh, initiative. So I'd like to know a bit, uh, a bit more, how, uh, how does it work? For, how do you get, for example, the, an ISP to, to put that page there? Do you, have a, do you contact them prior or do you already have them? Or? Generally, we just publish it out. We've got pages on our website that advertise what it does. And then through our members, we know lots of ISPs and they're aware the program exists. Okay. Um, so it's not something we've done tons of marketing around. It's mainly word of mouth within the community. Um, okay. But the site is, you know, when someone comes to the site, 
So the ISP would redirect or whoever has the, the DNS for that URL, you know, could, anybody could. They redirect, when a site hits, it looks at your browser, obviously, to detect your language and then directs you to the right page. You know, for Portuguese or Spanish or English, okay. French, we've got Russian, we've got several Asian languages, and we've got Chinese and Japanese and Korean, I believe. Um, and then it's it's just a baker's page with yeah you know, it's like a cartoon page you know okay so it's later. Oh, yeah my question is is more for example because uh, I am very interested into trying and get some ISPs to work uh, with that right so yeah. that well, maybe I'll talk to you later yeah yeah just yeah, redirect but, them to uh, us there's there's a, a page on the website um, one of the things I was going to talk about this afternoon is we're actually fixing to um, revamp the page to bring it a little more up to date with current okay. standards and make sure it fits pretty in a mobile browser as opposed to the big browsers. Um, yeah, the last code I ever wrote was that site, and I hope I'm getting somebody else to do it this time. Yeah, excellent. No, yeah, I just wonder if we, because it, maybe we here at the, the Lexus Suits meeting, we could talk about, and uh, it would be great if we would, could have a campaign to get ISPs yes. to use that, you know? I yeah, think it's I would love to see more use on it. it cool. You know, and, and it's, you can, if you watch the statistics, we do track the usage, and you can tell when an ISP has picked it up, because all of a sudden, you'll see it go from a couple of thousand a day to a couple of hundred thousand a day. And then it'll drop back down and then boom, it'll shoot back up. So it's out there and it's, it does a good job. And it is, there was, it actually grew out of one of our research papers from the, I think it was the second um, e-crime researchers, one we did in 07, from Carnegie Mellon. They were doing some research around educating users on, on how to best educate users uh, to prevent phishing, and what they called it was that um, learning moment. It's that is when you do something wrong, if you slap them in the back of the head and go, don't do that again, they learn. And that's kind of the pretense of the system. You click on a bad link, boom, you get this page that goes, don't do that again. And that's the best time to catch them and educate them. And that's kind of, that's what, where the system actually came from. So there was research behind it. <laughs> Yes. Hi, I'm Niels um, Liberia from UTS Curacao. Yeah. Um, of course, you understand we have a different language there. We have Papiamento, which is not really used in a lot of areas in the world. Like, will it be a way to where we can translate it and provide it to you to create? You that provide or? me the text, and I will get the site up there. Okay. Um, that's where all of the translations come from our members. Okay. I mean, obviously, you know, when I grew up, there was one language in South Georgia. <laughs> I understand. Okay. So um, <laughs> I depend on others. Um, and and that's where we got every one of those pages that's translated up there came from just like this, a member in our group that said, hey, I'll, I'll sit down and spend a couple hours and do that. Okay. And then you do have Dutch, right? That's one thing? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, Dutch, Dutch is up there. I'm 99% sure. Like I said, I think there's 21 languages 21. right now. Okay. Then we'll, we'll talk outside. Cheers. And I'm here all week. Love Thank to. You. Thank you. Perfect. We have time for more questions. Anyone? Us? Oops. Perfect. No more questions. Thank you very much. That's thank you for it.